right, good morning all, or good afternoon, depending which part of the world you're in. Um, so as Dick's already said, I'm just going to talk about the Lubaloza project and how it ended up becoming Green Muscle. I'm the last remaining Lubaloza person at Cabby, the rest have retired or moved on to pastures new. Um, and it was my first job when I started at Cabby in um, 1996. So I'm just going to go right back to basics. So I apologise if you know this already. Um, I'm going to just say what biopesticides are, then more importantly, what microbial pesticides are, how they work. Then I'm going to talk about Lubaloza. And then if I've got time, I'm just going to talk about some projects that we've got in China that follows on from the Lubaloza work. So bellow pesticides are plant production products uh, which contain a biological control agent. Uh, pheromones, microbials, plant extracts that can be used in agriculture, horticulture and in uh, the gardening world. So pheromones um, are often mating disruptors, plant extracts, the most common one being neem oil, and then you've got microbials in there as well. And then microbials can be further split into four different categories. You've got bacteria, which are very good at controlling um, caterpillars, so BT is the most common one there. You have nematodes, which are little worms that uh, are very good at controlling um, slugs and soil-borne pests. And then we have viruses, and the best one there is Helicoverpa. Uh, it's the most widely known, and again, that's for controlling caterpillars in the main. And then you have fungi, which is what we're interested in. Now, we're looking at fungi that control insects, but you can also have fungi like Trichoderma that control other fungi. So and the most important thing to take from this slide is that each one of these different boxes have different modes of action. They all act in different ways. So you can't, and this is why it's confusing for people to say a biopesticide because they are so varied. Um, I think it causes problems for ourselves. So green muscle, or sorry, Lubaloza was um, the project that started in 1989 and it's French for biological control of locusts and grasshoppers. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce it, but it's there on the screen for those who would. And it was a 12 million uh, US dollar multi-donor funded project. And it really was very unique in many ways, not only through the science, but actually that all these donors came together to fund this. This was a huge project that lasted 13 years. And through the, the research side of things, it really revolutionized how bi biological control was, was seen from the outside world. It looked at everything from finding the suitable isolates, mass production to a commercial scale, um, shelf life, storage life, formulation, application, everything was studied within this project, looking at um, also um, ecological effects as well. And at the end of this uh, project and it was done in different phases. Uh, there was a commercial product called Green Muscle. Originally this was on license to BCP in South Africa but through various acquisitions and mergers uh, it ended up at BASF and they've decided that it didn't really, Green Muscle didn't really fit within their portfolio and after a few years they decided that they wanted to step back from that and that's when um, elephant bear took over the production and sales of green muscle. So I want to say how green muscle works. So you'll spray the formulation and you spray it as you would um, a chemical pesticide. So in conventional, um, well, in ultra low volume uh, sprayers. And the spores can either land directly onto the insect or they can land on the vegetation and the locust or grasshopper will pick it up from the vegetation. It doesn't need to be ingested like BT, it can just physically touch the locust. And then when it does touch the locust and it recognizes the key signal, this is a locust, it starts to grow. If it lands on a different organism, for example a bee, it doesn't have those chemical cues and therefore it won't start to germinate and it won't kill them. So it really is very specific just to locusts and grasshoppers, which is great from an environmental point of view. Once the spore starts to germinate, it pushes a penetration peg, which it mechanically pushes through the cuticle of the insect, and then it starts to grow inside. And it effectively is eating the locust from the inside out. 
And then when the locust dies, it often turns a, a pinky colour, which is due to the um, toxins that the uh, metarhizium produces, but they are in very small quantities, so not harmful to um, wildlife or humans. And then these spores can be re-released if the environmental conditions are favourable, so if it's humid. And then those spores can go on and reinfect locusts again, and we call that secondary recycling. Now, locusts are particularly cheery chaps in the fact that if they see their mate who's not very well, they'll actually cannibalise him. And that actually works to green mussels' advantage because it means that they're then passing on those spores which are located within the inside of the locust. But this um, system and how quickly green mussel works is very dependent on temperature. And that's why I've got seven to 20 days on average to work in the field. So seven days would be optimum um, environmental parameters for the fungus to kill that quickly. Now you need to understand the locust life cycle to be able to understand where green mussel fits in with it. So locusts go through five instars before they become adults. And it's when they become adults that they can fly. And that's when they're the big problem to agriculture. Locusts normally lay their eggs in undisturbed soil, so in desert locations, away from agricultural crops. So when they are hatch and they're in stars, it's not too much of a problem. It's when they turn to adults and they can fly to the crop land, that that's when they are their biggest threat. Now, you often find that in the field, um, you should ideally attack locusts in the third instar. You don't tend to get much um, spraying of first and second instars, and that's purely because of the size of them, they're very difficult to see. So for example, a first instar will be about eight millimeters in size, so very, very difficult to see um, out in the field. But if you can apply from third instar onwards, then it's a race because obviously the speed of how quickly the locust develops is also dependent on environmental conditions. And then it's a bit of a, a race to see if the green mussel can kill the um, locust before it gets to an adult. And most of the time they can. So um, with part of the Lubaloza project, uh, lots of field trials were done. Obviously, started off with bioassays in the lab and then there was cage dials. But I just want to show you two um, applications that were done on a larger scale. So this was carried out in 1996 on 50 hectare plots. 100 grams of metarhizium was applied per hectare and for nitrile was applied at 250 grams per hectare. So on the y-axis you've got the density, so that's the number of locusts per metre squared. And then you've got days after treatment along the bottom. The white is the control, nothing was sprayed. The red is the chemical control, and the green is the metarhizium, the, the green muscle. So I look at the control line first, the white line, you can see that that's pretty stable from day minus three to day 22. It doesn't really change in population numbers. The phenytrophion, not surprisingly, has very low numbers after day, when it's measured on day four, because the chemical has come in, it's knocked it down. But what you notice very quickly is actually these numbers of locusts increase. And they're increasing because you're getting further hatchings or you're getting hoppers coming in from the surrounding areas. And in fact, at the end of, by 19 days, the numbers are the same as the control. So effectively after 19 days, the chemical isn't working. This is partly because of the half-life of the chemical. It's, it's designed to break down after a day, two days. And that's why you're not getting continued control. The metarhizium, on the other hand, you'll say that day seven, you're not really getting much of a change. And this is where people worry, it's like, oh, it's not working, they're not dying. However, if you give it a bit longer, you'll see that the numbers drop. And by day 13, you've got the same level of control as you have in the chemical. However, the chemical is increasing in numbers, metarhizium is coming down. So by day 22 or day 19 really you've got very good control of your locus and this is because the metarhizium survives longer in the field. It will survive a good seven days, probably longer if it's under vegetation protected from sunlight and then also you'll get this secondary recycling of spores that have killed the first locus which I've talked about. And then something else that actually was quite a, a problem for the Lubalosa team, was that when the locusts start to die, 
they become very lethargic, they don't move as much. So there's a lot more predation going on through birds, lizards, whatever it may be. Um, and this doesn't build through the food chain. So it's not harming the birds or the lizards if they eat the locusts that are killed with the metarism, infected with the metarism. The following year, instead of doing 50 hectare plots, an 800 hectare plot was done. So the, these are large scale trials that we did. And again, a similar story, the metarisium good control after 16 days. Again, the phenytropine after 10 days, there's no difference between the metarisium and the, um, the pesticide. And again, the numbers increase gradually with the phenytropion. So green mussel was field tested in all the countries here that are highlighted in green across Africa. Um, and they were tested on a variety of species. These are sort of larger scales, so the desert locust, the um, tree locust, variegated locust, African locust, Senegalese locust, and brown locust. Um, green mussel was also tested on a huge range of other locusts and grasshoppers. Some of them there, they've also been tested, uh, tested on the Australian plague locust, it kills that. It's been tested in America, it kills that. And we also had a project looking in Italy and Spain to control their locusts and it controls those, as well as the Chinese um, locusts. So it is quite uh, universal in killing locusts and grasshoppers and it kills all stages. So it will kill adults, um, although it is better to treat the nymphs um, before they reach the adults, because obviously adults can fly and eat a lot more. So Elephant Bear um, won the uh, right to produce and sell green mussel. And um, unfortunately, it was a bit slow to get the isolate in country. We had to go through um, the various regulations to get it in country. However, um, Elephant Bear now have it and are producing it on a large scale. It's registered in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, West Africa, and Madagascar. And it's allowed provisional sales in Kenya, Ethiopia, Somalia, and Saudi Arabia. And it's under registration in Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. Um, and previously, it's been registered in, in Sudan, South Africa, Mozambique, Zambia, Malawi, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, and Yemen. But these need to be re-registered. But obviously, there's a cost to this. So elephant bear having to do this in, in stages. And more importantly, FAO um, recommend and approve uh, use of green mussel in large scale. In Madagascar, it's been used on 60,000 hectare plots, 10,000 hectare plots in Tanzania, and in Somalia on 80,000 hect 80, hectare plots. It's quite interesting, in Somalia, uh, FAO will only supply green mussel because the chemicals were being stolen. The nice thing about green mussel, it's only gonna kill locusts and grasshoppers so you can send it and it's no point, it's not really a black market for it as, the, as it is for chemicals. So now I'd just like to talk how we've um, progressed our work on locusts. So this is a project that I had in China. It's called BioSuccess and it's an app to help end users know how quickly their biological is going to kill the locusts. As I mentioned before, it's very much dependent on environmental parameters. So if you look at the map on the left hand side, you will see that you've got pink at the bottom going for red, orange, yellows, greens, blues, and then black at the top. And the bar on the right hand side of this shows the number of days until you kill 90% of the population, sorry, um, with green muscle. So for example, this pink area, you would have 90% uh, of the locusts will be dead after 14 days. Now, if you look at the same area, but later in the year on the 15th of September, which is the graph on the right hand side, you'll see that that pink and purple area has increased to half of the map. And it means that in September, the biopesticide can work quicker because the environmental parameters are better. And we're developing this app to be done either on a phone um, or you can do it online. And it's really to help two people, to help the people in the field, but also help planning. We've got 15 years of data plugged into this that can, you can look at um, trends and what's happening and how climate is affecting the uh, use of biopesticides. We've also looked at drone um, applications, and I had a project in Inner Mongolia that 
uh, was working with Loughborough and Lincoln universities and we were trying to uh, determine if we could work out the population density of locusts by flying a, dry, a drone over. We looked at very different cameras and obviously the different heights that the, flown, the drone could fly at. Now in Inner Mongolia, though it's relatively flat, it's quite windy. So the minimum distance that the drone could safely fly was two meters above the ground. In our initial work, we found that our cameras needed to be 1.5 meters away from the ground to be able to distinguish the locusts. And if you look in the bottom picture here, you can see the locust quite cleanly on the clearly on the green leaves, but it's not so easy to see these locusts here. I'm using my arrow, I'm not sure if you can see that, which are on the brown background. So there was a lot of artificial training, lots of photos taken to develop these. And Lincoln have gone on to develop an app for an Android phone where you can take a picture and it will count the numbers there. These are really early stages, nothing to commercialise at the moment, but a good start to be going forward with. And I also have a new project in China that's looking at using drones to spray biopesticides. Biopesticides are very different to uh, chemicals because they've got particles in them. How do those particles uh, separate out in the drone? Do they block the nozzles? And also most drones at the moment, I've only seen one drone that does um, ultra low volume application, but most drones are water-based. Most locust control is done in oil on ultra low volume. So there's a mismatch at the moment with drone application and locust application, which will need to be considered in the future. So this is a very quick overview. So I hope you'll be um, asking questions or things that you'd like to, uh, clarified. But I would say that green muscle is better used preventative and not as curative. It can have better kill in the field, as I've shown with the field trials that were done. Um, it's environmentally friendly. And in my opinion, Cabby should be promoting the use of green muscle. Thank you. <laughs>